Hello and welcome to the second video in my Quartz Clock series. I'm Robert Massioli and today I want to talk to you about how fast can a quartz clock spin? So the question is today, if we have you know a regular wall clock, how fast can we actually get the hands to rotate around the clock? Like how fast could we make it so that if we're in like a movie it looked like one of those midnight super fast clock runs? Here we have what you might recognize from the previous video. We have a deconstructed quartz clock with some of the gears on the back and this electronic mechanism down here. This is what I'm going to be focusing on in this video. Now as an aside, I, I didn't mention some things in the last video. For example, I didn't mention that the type of motor in this clock is actually called a Levette style motor after the person that invented it. And I also didn't really explain how this electronics works at all. So let's lift up this board and have a closer look here. What you see right here is the fundamentals of the motor. We have this piece of sort of brownie metal, copper metal here, which is the solenoid. And we have this little pinion gear here. Now on the back of it, as you remember, there's a magnet and the solenoid creates a magnetic field that causes the pinion gear to flip one way and another each second tick. If you remember, this here is the actual quartz crystal. We'll take the little gear out. And this is the circuit that controls it. So what you might be able to notice is that right here on the back, there are two little connection points, one here and one there. That's where the wires from the solenoid connect onto the electronic circuitry itself. So let's make that a little bit more obvious by first sliding this out, which it will do easily because the gear is no longer there. We'll pop this metal piece off, put all our little components to the side, and we'll just focus on the real crux of the motor, how the solenoid connects to the electronics. Because if we want this to spin as fast as possible, then we're going to need to replace this electronics with something custom that we've created ourselves. And that's what we're going to be doing. So the first step here, I want to disconnect the solenoid from the electronics so then I can then reconnect the solenoid to my own electronics. Hopefully that's making complete sense. So first let's pop that out. Do that to the other side. Pop it out again. Oh, nice. Now as you can see, we've nearly got the electronics completely disconnected from the solenoid. So what we'll do is we'll put that down like so. Now be very careful when you do this. This is what I'm going to use. It's my soldering iron. It's going to decouple this from that. I'm just heating it up so it'll take some time. There we go started melting, we might be able to start disconnecting it in a second. There we go, one wire's off, hope you saw that. Now for the second wire. There we go, both wires are off and our electronics are disconnected from our solenoid. So now that we've disconnected the electronic circuitry from the solenoid, what we really want to do is figure out how to make the solenoid change direction once every second tick. How might we do that? Well, this is kind of what we want. If you imagine that this here is the solenoid with one wire coming out one side and one wire coming out the other, then on the first second tick, we want to make the current go through it in this direction. And on the second tick, we want to make the current go through it in the opposite direction. And then we want to keep going this one, that one, this one, that one. Every second tick, we want to keep swapping the direction. So as you can see, a change of direction is required here. But it's kind of tricky thinking about how to do that in electronic circuitry, especially if you've never seen how to do that before. So I'm going to give you a quick explanation of how that might work. So if we're, if we're trying to work it out from scratch, here's kind of what we want. If we want the solenoid to go in, let's say, the forwards direction, if this is the solenoid with like one connection here and one connection here, and this is like our positive power and this is ground, what we want to do is we want to connect positive to one side and then negative to the other, the first time around, and that gets it going in one direction. And the second time around, 
we really want to connect it in the other way around. So that the positive goes into the right hand side this time and the negative comes out the left hand side. And what we really want to do is every second we want to swap it from the backwards configuration to the forwards configuration. Backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards. How might we do that though? What I've come up with is this. In this situation, you can see that it's pretty much the forwards and the backwards situations combined together, except we've got these four circles here with A's and B's labeled in them. Now, for the sake of argument, you can think of these circles as switches. So if I turned switch, both switches labeled switch A off, and I turn switch B on, well, what does that look like? That looks like the backwards direction. And if I turn the B's off, but the A's on, Look at that, that's the forwards direction. So just by turning off these two switches and these two switches at the same time, we can get the motor to spin in opposite directions. This circuit here is actually called a H-bridge driver because of the letter H that is formed when you draw it as an electronic circuit. And instead of these, you can make these switches, but usually these are actually transistors so that you can control them with other electronic circuitry. This is a circuit that you can find made in many ICs, but we're going to make one ourselves because it's just more rewarding that way. So let's see what an actual H-bridge driver looks like. Before we do that, let's quickly clean up our working space here. So here is a H-bridge driver that I made earlier. So as you can see, we've got four transistors in here. One, two, three, four. They're the four switches in the H-bridge driver circuit that are the A's and B's. What do we also have? We have these two wires here. The red one goes into positive and the blue one goes into negative. So these are our positive and negative supply rails. We have these two white wires, which are A and B respectively. So if I turn one wire on and one wire off, then that will trigger one direction. And if I turn it the other way, that'll trigger the other direction. And so finally, the red wires are what you actually connect to the solenoid. So the power goes backwards and forwards through the solenoid. These are kind of the middle connections so that whatever you put inside the circle in the middle of the previous diagram, which I'll show again, if this is the circle in the middle of the diagram, the red wires connect to that. If you've got A's and B's here, that's the white wires. And the positive and negative that you see here are these wires. That's how it works, very simple. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and get this solenoid and connect it to the red wires. That way we can use this circuit to control this solenoid. Let's do that now. And what we're going to do is we're going to push this along a bit and get this. I'm going to clean up our wires. And what we're going to want to do is connect one wire to one cable and one wire to the other. It's a bit delicate when you do this yourself. Remember that these are you know, not the strongest copper wires. They're very small and very easy to damage. Now also when you do this, don't do what I'm doing and do it on a wooden table. Please take more care with your soldering. In fact, I don't take any responsibility for what happens to you in your own soldering. I recommend that you only do this once you've soldered many things yourself before, like I have. Okay, it looks like we've got the first one connected. That's good news. Blow on it a little to cool it down. Let's connect the, nut, the other one. Okay, I think that did it. Yep. Yeah. It looks like we've got both of them connected. Good news. Okay. Now that we have the solenoid connected to the H-bridge, what we want to do is quickly connect it back up to the rest of the hardware so that we can see what it looks like when it's spinning. And then get our handy pinion gear and stick it in up here and presto we have this connected again. Now we very carefully spin it round 
and get it ready for the next stage of operation. In order to control this HBridge driver, what we're going to need to do is connect these cables A and B to some sort of electronic circuitry that can manipulate them, that can make A go on while B is off and B off while A is on. For this project, I've chosen an Arduino to do that for us. This chip here, that probably reads upside down to you, is an Arduino chip. This circuit board is connected to the Arduino so that it can send signals in and out through these ports. And this cable here is connected to my computer and it's a USB cable capable of uploading programs to the Arduino. So what we can do for this experiment is upload a computer program into the Arduino. The Arduino controls A and B on the H-Bridge driver and the H-Bridge driver controls the motor. So let's see that in action. Let's connect this up. So we'll put the Arduino down here. We'll connect ground to ground and positive to positive. We'll connect this to pin 11 and this to pin 12. Now, hopefully what you can see in the very bottom corner here is the spinning motor. So just to re sorry for bumping the camera, just to reiterate what's happening, we've uploaded a program into the Arduino. The Arduino is giving power to the electric circuit. It's controlling pins A and B. The H bridge driver is flicking back and forth. Oh, hit the camera again, sorry. And we're spinning the motor. Woohoo! We have finally got an electric circuit that we can control a motor with. So let's now try something that's a bit fun. What we'll do is we'll get this marker right here and we'll mark the motor so that you can see it spinning. So I'll just stop it with my finger, that'll do the trick. And put a nice little mark there. See it? There we go. You can see it's spinning back and forth now. Remember, each half revolution is supposed to represent a second tick. And right now, I've got it spinning such that the spin takes one-fifth of a second. So we're getting five ticks per second. Let's see what will happen if we vary that. I've just uploaded a program to the Arduino that has made this tick at one second intervals. So as you can see now, if you're watching closely, one, two, three, four, it's ticking once per second, doing a half rotation once per second. What I promised you in the beginning of the video though, is that we would figure out exactly how fast we can make this clock spin. And to do that, we're going to need to figure out how we're going to control our H driver as quickly as possible. So if you remember the H driver, the way it works is we turn A on at the same time or B on at the same time, but we don't turn both A or B on at the same time because that would form a direct line from positive straight to negative, which is a short circuit. So A's and B's we need to make sure aren't on at the same time, but we need to go from A on to B on to A on to B on, flicking back and forth so that the motor and the solenoid flicks back and forth. So our program is going to look something like this. As you can see, this is the first scenario, A on and B is off. I've actually redrawn that as A and B. If A's got a hat, if like the letter has a hat on it, then it's on. So this is A off, B off, no hats. A off, B on, B's got a hat. A off, B off, again, nobody has a hat. So this basically means A's on, stop. B's on, stop. And what we do is we loop through this program again and again, and it looks like this. A on, halt, B on, halt, A on, halt, B on, halt, and so on forever. And that's what makes this go, you know, A on, halt, B on, halt, A on, halt, B on, halt, A on, halt. Yeah, you get it? So what we're left with is an on time and an off and a halt time. So how long do we keep a or B on when they're on, and how long do we wait before flicking them again? So in this current program here, I can tell you that what has worked well is a five millisecond on time to flick the motor around to the other side, and a 995 millisecond delay time to wait till the next on. What that means is that all up, 995 
plus 5 is 1,000, and 1,000 milliseconds is 1 second. That's why we're getting regular 1 second ticks, because they add up to 1 second. So to make the example a bit better, what we're going to do is put this back in its original enclosure. There we go. Hopefully you can see that pretty clearly. You see how it's flicking back and forth, and the thing you should be paying attention to, just like in the original video, is the little blob on this side, and that it's always coming in the same direction. So, let's try and use trial and error to lower the delay time here to speed up the rotation and make it better. So, well, if now we've got a delay time of 995 milliseconds, all up adding to be a second, well, let's see if we can get half a second happening. So that would be 5 milliseconds on and 495 milliseconds off. That looks like this. I'm uploading the new program now, so it's halted for a second. And there we go. Oh, look at that. So that seems to be working and staying constant. Let's see what happens if we halve it again. So half of 500 is 250. And 250 minus 5 is 245. So that program is uploading now. There we go, that seems to be working, constantly spinning in the same direction. So let's half it again. Half of 250 is 125, 125 minus 5 is 120. So let's do a delay time of 120 milliseconds. Remember this is the delay between flicking back into the other direction or not. Ooh, that, that doesn't seem right. Look at that, that, that little circle's all over the shop. It's going back and forth and it's, it's not quite making it. What's happening here is that we have the motor being pulled one way or another, but never in a consistent direction. It's not being given enough time to freeze on the other side. So let's bring it back up again to 195 milliseconds. That program looks like this. That seems to be working. Okay, so we've now got this clock spinning at five times per second, and it's still moving in a consistent direction. That's good, that's what we want. So, well, we got to 120, that was way too fast. We got to 200, that's working. Let's see if we can halve it again. That's about 160-ish. So let's try a delay time of 160. We're not being very mathematical anymore, we're just gonna kinda use trial and error to get to a number that works. Okay, 160. All I'm looking for here, by the way, is that it continues spinning in a consistent direction all the time. So 160 seems to be working. Let's go even faster then. Let's try uh, halving 160 and 120. Half of that is about 140. So let's give that a shot. I have to say that appears to be working. Oh, no, it's not working. Okay, 140 didn't work. So let's try and go slower to 150. 150 looks like this. No, that doesn't work either. Do you just see it flip directions? That's not what we want. So 155. We'll wait for a little bit. Sometimes it takes time to change direction. I'm not even sure if it will change direction. Okay, I must say, it looks like 155 is working. So let's try just a bit faster. Let's try 152. Hundred and fifty-two, not bad. Hundred and fifty two is working well. So that looks good. Let's try 151, because obviously 150 didn't work. Hundred 
151 seems stable. I could be wrong. So I would say that 151 milliseconds delay time with a 5 second millisecond on time seems to be about the right amount of time for this clock to spin. Now my suspicion is this is going to change between clocks so it's more likely that we'll have to leave some sort of error bound of about 20 milliseconds so that it works for all quartz clocks. You may be wondering of course what happens if we try and lower the on time delay, try and scrap in a few milliseconds there. So let's see what an on time of 3 milliseconds looks like instead of 5 milliseconds. Ooh, doesn't even manage to spin to the other side. Look at that, it's not spinning at all. So okay, well between 3, 3 obviously doesn't work and 5 did, so let's try 4 milliseconds. Nah, that's not working either. It's barely managing to move along. So this confirms what I was saying before. Uh, what I found out originally, which is that 5 milliseconds is the absolute fastest, I can, uh, absolute lowest time I can use as my on time to get it to spin correctly. And this is what we want to see. And that's it. That's, I've done what I promised. We can now see exactly how fast we can get this quartz clock to spin. Isn't that amazing? What I strongly recommend you do is you go away and you try this yourself. Get a clock, try and see how fast you can get it to spin. At this point in time, I just want to say thank you for sticking along with this video for so far. It's been a long video, but I'm hoping you learnt a lot from it. So just a quick recap. What we've learnt is how to get this motor, pinion motor to spin using the solenoid connected to a H-bridge driver through an Arduino to a computer. This is something you could do at home, and I'm really hoping that you do so. So what I'm going to do at the bottom of the video, I'm first going to link to a H-driver tutorial so that you can better understand how this works. Then I'm going to link to the Arduino homepage so that you can learn more about Arduinos. And finally, I'm going to link to my own blog post where I'm going to explain the findings here and what it means for you. And also do a bit of mathematics so that you can see how you might manipulate this to get a real fast clock spin time. Thank you for watching my video on how fast can a quartz clock spin. This is Robert Mascioli bringing this video in 2014, although by the time you see it, it'll probably be 2015. Thanks for watching, have a great day.